In part two of this long lecture on Sichu and Chinese painting, I'll show and discuss at length the album of landscapes by him that I mentioned several times in part one. That is, the album that has been strangely neglected by Sechu scholars in Japan, but which I believe is not only a genuine work by him, but a work that's deeply important in understanding his relationship to Chinese painting, painting of the Southern Song period especially, and how he moved out of his early dependence on it to become a thoroughly Japanese master. First images, please. It's an album of 22 landscapes in the styles of Southern Sung masters, all signed simply as Seshu. It's not uncommon for him to sign his works in this simple way, so that doesn't present any problem. There's no accompanying leaf of text, so far as I know, and no indication of date. I've never seen the album in the original, and I know it only from an old reproduction album, which was published in two forms. One, presumably the more expensive, with the pictures in color, as seen here, the other with black and white color type plates. The only copy I know of the one with color plates is in the Princeton University Library, and I discovered it there during my year there at the Institute for Advanced Studies in 1998 to 99. The pictures were copied for me later by Michael Hatch, to whom I again express my gratitude. A copy of the black and white edition is in our University of California Library. I'll show some of both, but mostly the color plate ones, which are mostly only ink tones on a yellowish ground, copying the ink on silk leaves, with only faint touches of warm and cool color washes. We're looking at two of the leaves that are in the UGN splashed ink manner, although I say that only from the style. There are no written indications of stylistic sources on these leaves, or accompanying them, so far as I know. Next. Here is the publisher's colophon page at the end of the reproduction album, revealing that it was published in the 43rd year of the Meiji era, that is uh, 1910, by the Tokyo art book publisher Shimbi Shoen, and that the original Seshu album is owned by Marquis Hosokawa. Uh, the text was written by Tajima Shiichi, who worked with Shimbi Shoen during this period to produce a series of albums of reproductions of major Japanese and Chinese paintings. The Hikoen album that we looked at in a previous lecture was one of these. Tajima uh, wrote about the album, quote, There are many pictures done by Seshu still existing, among which the long scroll belonging to Prince Mori comes first, and next to it the present album. When we look at the pictures in this album, we readily understand that Seshu was far superior even to the great artists of the Sung China, such as Ma Yuan, Xia Gui, etc. No other work by Seshu can be compared with them." End quote. The idea of Seshu being superior to Ma Yuan and Xia Gui is, of course, an expression of nationalism, understandable in the Meiji period context, but hardly anybody today would claim that, I think. But recognizing the album as next after the long scroll among Seshu's work still makes sense, and I would be inclined to agree. So, is the album given that kind of recognition by Japanese Seshu scholars today? Not at all. In most volumes on Seshu and exhibitions of his paintings, it hasn't even been included. A recent Seshu exhibition reproduced it in the catalog, but only among the minor or questionable works not in the exhibition, but collected on separate pages at the end of the catalog. Here it is, all 22 leaves on one page. Next. Years ago, when I was preparing my lecture on Seshu and Sesson for delivery at Los Angeles, I wrote to my former student Hiromitsu Kobayashi, he and I are seen here on a visit to a dealer, asking him why this Seshu album, considered by Tajima to be one of Seshu's two finest works, hasn't been shown and studied. He replied, after looking into the matter and making some inquiries, that he didn't really know the answer to that. The whereabouts of the album is known, it's still in the Hosokawa family collection, and it could have been borrowed for their great exhibition of Seshu at the Tokyo National Museum, but it wasn't. Do the Japanese scholars doubt its authenticity? Are they uncomfortable with their great master painting pictures so heavily derivative from Chinese styles? I don't know the answer to that question. 
and have to leave it open, but it will always be hovering in the background as we look at the leaves of this album, as we will now. Next. The first leaf. We should note that a few indications of pale washes of color, bluish on the water, yellowish on the thatched roofs, suggest that the paintings in this album are not purely monochrome. A bent-over traveler in the lower right approaches thatched houses on the shore of a river. A boat is seen at left, and what must be two boatmen, sitting facing each other, presumably waiting for passengers. Seshu combines these elements in ways that a southern Shung artist wouldn't have done. But why not? He's moving toward a certain independence from his Chinese models. Then we move back to the further shore, and still further back to far distant mountains. A tingza, or rest shelter, is seen on a spit of land where he'll disembark and proceed on his journey. He might stop there to rest and gaze at the scenery. Tingza were placed in Sung period landscapes, you'll remember, to indicate places where the viewer should imagine doing that. As for the style of this first leaf, it's loosely that of a Li Tong follower. Next. The second leaf presents more or less the same subject as one of Seshu's fan paintings we saw. A man with a staff indicating his age has come out in early spring with his boy servant to a place where his estate, uh, you see the fence to their right, where his estate ends at the water's edge. He gazes across a small inlet at two plum trees that are beginning to blossom. The style is loosely that of Ma Yuan. Again, there appear to be bluish washes on the water and reddish on the man's coat. It's a fine, spacious composition that appears to be pretty much independent of any Chinese source. The next. In leaf three, an old man sits on the bank of a stream, gazing across at where a rivulet flows into it on the opposite side. His boy servant stands behind him, and behind both of them is a cave with two barrel seats. A friend will come to talk, and they will sit there. A pine tree overhead frames them in a Ma Yuan way. The whole style and the pictorial elements belong in the Ma Yuan tradition. While the picture differs in composition and the images that make it up from any of his, the picture is masterful in its effect of space and distance. Here for comparison is a signed Ma Lin fan painting in the Cleveland Museum. Sestru's is obviously richer and more interesting. I don't mean that as a general judgment of the two artists, as I mentioned when showing another of uh, Ma Lin's works in the lecture devoted to him, Ma Lin must have painted hundreds of such small works for his imperial patrons to give out as gifts. Ma Lin paints sometimes as though conscious of being at the end of his line, as he does, as he does here. How much Seshu understood of the expressive implications of the late Sung paintings he learned from, we can't say. Probably not much, because the Ming artist that he met in China had pretty much forgotten them already. This fourth leaf is one of the two we've already seen in the style of Yu Jin. Note the houses on shore in the lower right, the shoreline at left, with what are probably meant as reeds, some simple suggestions of trees and hills in the distance above, and in the center a mass protruding into the water. A rock? It's ambiguous as is the vertical broken brush stroke above it, connecting near and far in the loosest way. And all this is accompanied by subtle ink washes that render misty space while revealing enough of what lies beyond them to conjure up a river shore largely concealed by a band of fog stretching across it. We begin to see and wonder, is Seshu moving significantly past his late sung models in a way that no Chinese artist seems to have done? I don't think I'm overstating the matter and putting it this way. But let's go on and look at the others with an open mind. This leaf, the fifth, is loosely in the manner of Xiaogui and presents an evening scene with a heavy, heavily hooded figure, a farmer or another laborer, returning on a path between leafy trees toward the thatched houses that are his destination. Above, as the path continues through the hills, we see a few of what look like temple roofs. The white oval markings against the trees and the small one above the houses must be areas of damage filled in with new silk. This again is a composition with lots of loose references back to an old Chinese manner, but newly conceived or imagined. Next. 
Here the model is obviously Ma Yuan, and it's one of his favorite subjects, or at least of his followers. But here again the whole conception seems new, heavily overhanging rocky masses at the top, the stream winding through a gap between them and dropping as a waterfall, the gaucher or lofty scholar stopping as he makes his way along the path on the opposite shore to sit gazing at it and into the misty depths below. A Chinese artist probably wouldn't have let the grassy slope at left end below like a rocky mass or made the fence along the path so low it wouldn't keep our scholar from falling over but would only trip him. Next. Ma Yuan, as seen in this signed leaf in the Cleveland Museum of Art, wouldn't have made those mistakes. And yet, Sestri's painting uh, projects a certain drama beyond what he could have learned from Ma Yuan. Again, I raise the question, is what we see here not so much simple imitation as a Gombrich or Kubler-like next step in a quasi-developmental series? An artist inherits a set of schemata and transforms them in his paintings into something new, his own? Is that what it is? Even to suggest that raises big problems. Can such a continuing series jump over three centuries and to a different national and cultural tradition? Next. This, the seventh leaf, is the second of three leaves in this album in the manner of Yu Jian, and like the first we saw, it has left its model behind it to create something essentially new. The old elements remain minimally. In lower left, a boat with a figure in it and a pole projecting from it, more evoked than depicted, houses on the shore in lower right. And between and beyond those, a series of five broad patterns of ink moving back into distance, to be read only by our familiarity with this landscape formula as a rocky shore, a large boulder on the shore, another above to the left, some tree foliage above that, and dimly seen hilltop above to the right. And enveloping all these subtle washes of pale ink suggest, only because we know enough to read them this way, the misty shore and the areas of fog enveloping the landscape above. The near masses are given volume by contrasts of inked and empty that evoke visual memories of masses treated this way with strong light and shadow. The subtleties, the remarkable mass and space effects of this leaf emerge only when one gazes at it for a long time, as I have made you do by talking about it for so long. So on to the next. Another winter landscape, a richly elaborate composition, not easy to parallel in Southern Cinema Academy painting, although that obviously underlies it. It's another scene of arriving home at the end of a cold winter day, with the farmer, or whoever he is, walking over a plank bridge in lower left, carrying his load on a pole over his shoulder, approaching the cluster of thatched roofed houses. The bare trees and the dotting on the rounded peak may remind us of, next please, late Sung paintings in the manner of Fan Quan, such as this fan-shaped leaf ascribed to him in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, which I showed in a series of paintings representing later phases of the Fan Quan style or tradition. This too has a figure wearing a broad sheltering hat approaching a small village or a cluster of houses. Seshu does not include a temple in his picture as the follower of Fan Quan does, preserving something of that old movement from a mundane secular world to a religious one and then up to the bare peak. Notice how in Seshu's picture the cold water, not yet frozen, swirls around the shoreline rocks. Once more, Seshu is moving from a familiar type into a new, more elaborate composition than any such derivative we have in Chinese painting. Next. I insert here, however, this image of a horizontal landscape painting in the Shokokuji, a Zen temple in Kyoto, representing a winter landscape with travelers. The inscription on it is by Zekai Chushin, a Japanese monk of the late 14th century, and it attributes it to a Yuan period follower of Xia Gui named Zhang Yuan. But a Japanese scholar named Waki Moto, for some reason, published it as a Korean painting. And the, the bad practice of Japanese scholars of never questioning the judgment of some Dai Sensei or great teacher or major scholar has led to its carrying that wrong attribution ever since. 
I published it in my Hills Beyond a River book, chapter 2, figure 14, as quite possibly a work by Zhang Yuan, and in any case, as a post-sung work in the Xiaogui lineage. You can read my discussion of it there, so I won't repeat it now. My point in introducing it here is to observe that the absence of much work by post-sung Xiaogui followers among extant paintings doesn't mean there weren't any, but only that they weren't popular and weren't preserved. Sestru surely saw such paintings, and one or more of them may well underlie this leaf. Next. The ninth leaf is the third in the album that follows loosely the splashed ink landscape manner of Yu Jen. If only the Sestru scholars of Japan would pay attention to this album, it would provide them a better context for some of the master's well-known works, including the famous Habuku landscape of 1495. Once more, the familiar materials, river shore, house tops, a knoll rising from the shore and topped with trees, snowy hills behind and above, a wintry sky, are arranged into an interesting new composition. And again the artist has allowed several of his brushstrokes to break somewhat from their descriptive function to take on one more calligraphic, more divorced from representation. The bold black stroke at the center of the picture, made with a broad, flat brush, down, sideward, down again, barely works in defining the hillock, but it works. Steep side, a flat area partway down, and again steep side, down to ground level. The same is true of the Z-shaped stroke below, minimally representing a shoal stretching into the water. And again, these bold brushworky marks are set in an atmospheric space created by the subtlest gradations of pale ink wash for the wintry sky and darker ones for the water that approach but stop short of the edges of the shore. Seemingly simple, the leaf proves when we really look at it to be unsimple and masterly. And the fact that we can find strikingly similar brushstrokes, broad and recognizable as descriptive of landscape elements, only through conventions fixed in his viewers' eyes and mind, helps to establish this album, if anything more were needed, as a genuine work by Sessu. It may be that comparisons of this kind with paintings in the established Sessu canon will help to date the album within his oeuvre. The broad Z-shaped stroke for the knoll, the group of trees appear, at least to my eyes, as clearly from the same hand. Next. Leaf 10 is another more elaborate winter landscape, with a traveler under a broad umbrella approaching some buildings. One of those to the right of the rocky boulder has the sign out showing that it's an inn and maybe his destination, but he may also be headed for the building seen only as rooftops in the lower left corner. Nicely observed is the way the snow accumulates on the tops of the willows, but not on the pine trees. The road continues up to the left under the overhanging rocky cliff and more smaller and dimmer rooftops are visible beyond that. Here again we can see forms and motifs and compositional ideas that appear also in Sestru's better known paintings, and if this album were seriously studied in the context of those, its chronological place within Sestru's works should become clearer. I used to think of it as a relatively early work done soon after his return from China, but more looking changes my mind, and I now would see it as around the time of the Haboku landscape, when Sestru was making his decisive break with Sung and Chinese painting, moving into what would be a more Japanese style. And again, I say that without trying for now to define what I mean. Next. Leaf 11 is an imposing landscape, painted in a style derived from the following of Li Tong. We saw some works of that kind in the Lecture 9 series of Pure and Remote View, and I'll show one of them in a moment. A gentleman, followed by his servant, is exiting the scene in lower left, and pausing to look back at the temple, where, we can suppose, he rested or spent the night before proceeding on his journey. The rocky masses are dynamic and imposing. The one in lower left, for instance, thrusts upward like a clenched fist. The road that the traveler has taken reappears as we visually retrace it in the lower right and again above, leading upward or back to the temple, which is seen as a cluster of roofs. 
Next. Interestingly related is this fan-shaped painting, a signed work by an otherwise unknown master named Wu Shu Ming. I showed it in the lecture on Li Tong followers. It's in the Umezawa collection in Japan. The theme here is more common. The two travelers on the road leading in from lower right are approaching the temple, and one holds out his arm to point it out to the other. The road on which they will continue after stopping there is seen above at the right. Seshu appears to have once more taken the main elements of a Chinese compositional type and rearranged them so as to give them a new context and a new meaning in his picture, one that to my knowledge would never have been undertaken by a Chinese artist, leaving the temple instead of approaching it. But this is true of the whole album. One can imagine Seshu thinking, why are the travelers arriving at the temple all the time? Why can't I show them leaving it? And so forth. The stepped, angular outlines of the undersides of the overhanging cliffs, the broadened, axe-cut texturing of the rocky surfaces, and the steeply vertical peaks in the far distance all belong to the Li Tong landscape manner. Next. The twelfth leaf is still another winter landscape, and another that's original in its richly structured composition. Our traveler walking under a broad umbrella walks across a snow-covered bridge in lower right, approaching the river shore, where he will pass by a few thatched houses, to where a boat is moored among the reeds, a boat with a canopy under which a traveler can shelter, while the boatman sculls it across the river. The three rocky masses extending back just right of center, pushing powerfully in opposite directions, Sheshu has learned from Sha Gui. Notice how well-shaped the upper surface of the distant hill is, how smoothly the water surface continues across the shoals beneath it. Uh, again, there appears to be a few touches of color, reddish on one tree to suggest late autumn, greenish on others. Next. Leaf 13 is a night scene with darkened sky and water. The season is once more winter. No travelers now. No roads that allow us to traverse the landscape in imagination. We can only gaze at it from a distance. The top of a multi-story building in the lower right, with lower buildings around it, indicate that we are gazing from a height over some kind of inlet, with a distant shore dimly visible in middle right. A white peak, seen only in silhouette against a darkened sky, marks the distance. And across the center of the scene are stretched the roofs of many houses among trees, with a single, taller building, perhaps a temple, rising above them at left. Those familiar with the Nanga painting of Japan might be reminded of Yosa Busan's wonderful hand scroll of snowy light over Kyoto. And indeed, if we were to reduce Seshu's leaf to a horizontal strip across the middle and juxtapose it with Busan's painting, we would have two quite similar pictures. I'm presenting this similarity only as a matter of coincidence. I don't mean to suggest some kind of Japanese tradition of depicting cities on a winter night, although that might be an interesting argument to make too, and it wouldn't be impossible to make. But I can't offhand think of other examples from Japanese painting, and I leave that one for someone else to follow up on. Next. Leaf 14 is the scene of a man in simple clothing perhaps a farmer, preceded by two donkeys carrying loads, arriving at a village. Several of the houses are open, and people facing each other, like guests at an inn having dinner, can be seen through the windows. Above at right, where the road presumably continues onward, is a Tingzi rest shelter, and in front of it, a tiny figure of another man with his donkey. The style is that of Li Tong followers and the whole scene may be reminiscent of those pictures in which the travelers approach their stopping place, where they will rest and continue their journey, with both the approach and the road going onward clearly depicted. This leaf of Seshu's may remind us of, next please, this leaf in the Freer Gallery of Art, a signed work by Yen Su Yu, one of two brothers, the other was Yen Su Ping, whose signed works I showed in my lecture on the followers of Li Tong. The softened form of the axe-cut texture strokes on the rocky surfaces, the distinctive shapes of the further mountains seen in silhouette, even the upside-down staircase shaping of the overhanging side of the main rocky peak is similar. 
One could almost suppose that Seshu saw this leaf, or one quite similar to it. But again, he turns these old materials to his own purposes and makes an essentially new picture. Next. The next three leaves in Seshu's album continue to play variations on the landscape style that had been developed by followers of Li Tong, as have others earlier in this album, for instance, the one we juxtaposed with the sign painting by Wu Shu Ming. Leaf 15, seen here, is a scene similar to several I showed by Xiao Gui, with a returning figure. Here it's a bent-over man who drags his walking staff behind him, expressing his weariness as he approaches his destination, the house scene seen only as a roof beneath the leafy trees. The leftward, rightward thrusts of the squared, rocky masses is another echo of Shaw Gui. But the boat moored on the shore in lower right would never have appeared with this complex of pictorial elements in a Shagwe leaf. Here again, Seshu is pushing beyond his models. Next. Leaf 16 is a relatively conventional scene of a traveler on a donkey, followed by a servant, entering in lower right on their way upward to the complex of temple buildings where they will rest before they continue their journey on a road that continues above to the right around the rocky peak, I mean. The temple buildings are not featured prominently, but are nestled comfortably on a ledge, occupying a ravine in the mountain complex. If we look closely at the figure of the mounted traveler, as our electronic instruments of viewing allow us to do, we can see how skillfully Seshu has conveyed his weariness in the way he leans forward and in his outthrust head. He has only a short way to go before he can collapse in comfort. Next. The third of these leaves, in the manner of Li Tong followers, is still another depiction of travel to a destination or stopping point. The road leads in from the lower left corner, continues around the base of the steep rocky cliffs, to disappear behind a fur the furthest and tallest one. But this time there is no clearly indicated stopping place. The roofs of thatched houses to the left of this, built on a reedy river shore, have no clear connection to the road and no signaling of an inn or hostel. And once again, as in a previous leaf, we see the upper parts only of buildings on the right lower margin of the picture, placing us higher up and gazing over them, an interesting, if uneventful, variant of our familiar type. Seshu seems here almost to be anticipating Yosa Busan in presenting these poetically ambiguous landscapes with houses and routes for travelers passing between them without marking their stopping places. Perhaps some similarly vague idea of varying the familiar theme of arrival at a portrayed destination is in his mind. Are we seeing, that is, some elements in a process of Japanization of the Chinese materials? My question again. Next. Leaf 18 marks a turn away from this series into a completely different kind of scene, this one evoking Ma Yuan. The gently arched hilltops alone would serve for that. Our traveler with his staff on the bridge in lower right is again not arriving but leaving the cluster of thatched houses behind a tall brushwood fence. Then we notice another figure of a cloaked man, perhaps his host who is bidding him farewell after an overnight stay. A large tree trunk in the lower right pushes out of the picture, appearing again only at some, at some loosely drawn branches and foliage above. The play of dark and heavy against light and patterned, the three rocks placed from foreground to middle ground against the tall reeds, brushwork fence before the houses, and blossoming tree and bamboo above and behind them, all this provides a nice contrast of weighty and solid against paler and textured. Altogether, another evocative and engaging scene, an original creation by Seshu, quite unlike any of the paintings commonly associated with him. A new artist, or a new vision of an artist we thought we knew well, is opening up with this album. Next. Leaf 19 is still another, in which familiar materials, again mostly associated with Ma Yuan and his followers, are combined and arranged in an unfamiliar way. In the lower left, a boat with a mast pole and ropes is moored beneath a projecting earth bank. Whether its mast passes in front of the bank or behind it is unclear, 
and Sestru seems to have changed his mind midway in painting this leaf, since the vertical line projects up into the underside of the bank but doesn't continue. Beyond are the familiar thatched houses by a grove of leafy trees. From there, a bridge takes us leftward over the stream to where we climb to a flat knoll overlooking the river, presumably. On it is a tingza, and in front of it, two men sitting facing each other in the familiar pairing. The recession beyond all these middle ground elements, with the stream flowing out of misty distance, above which a hilltop appears, is depicted with great restraint and sensitivity of a kind we don't usually associate with Seshu. Next. The twentieth leaf is more dramatic, another gazing at the waterfall scene. The whole upper left part of the picture occupied by one of those great overhanging cliffs that appear in some late sung landscapes by artists such as Liang Kai. Here the style is closer to Ma Yuan, and the scholar and his boy servant belong to his familiar staffage. We have to gaze at the rocks and pine tree above the waterfall for some time to clarify their relationship, but we see after a while that the tree trunk passes behind one of the three downward pointing masses, like inverted peaks that make up the rocky complex in upper right. Another captivating rethinking or reimagining of our overfamiliar scene. Next. Leaf 21 is clearly related to the 20th. They could be taken as forming a pair. Again, we are presented with the materials of a Mayuan scene, but find them freshly configured. The scholar pauses on his way across a simple plank bridge, seeming to stand on its very edge with more ease and aplomb than I would feel if I were placed there. And he gazes back at the streams of water pouring out of an unseen gorge between the great overhanging masses that occupy the upper part of the picture, mostly hidden in mist. The pine tree is a familiar occupant of Ma Yuan-style pictures. But instead of the boy servant, our scholar is followed by someone who appears older and is himself bent over and wearing a dark cloak. If we construct our lyric journey narrative around this scene, we have to vary it a bit to make it fit the picture. Seshu has again aroused our expectations of a well-worn scene, only to give us instead something refreshingly new. Next. The 22nd and last leaf brings the album to a pleasing close. If this is indeed the original order, and these are all the original leaves, neither of which is necessarily true, and I speak of an ideal sequence, a pleasing close in which our weary traveler has once more paused to rest on the river shore and gaze across at, at what? It's only with continued looking that we notice on the far shore a kind of platform from which a ramp with a railing on it leads down to the water, access no doubt to boats, identifying this as a kind of dock. But what is the long rectangular form stretching rightward from it, with, re with regular dark markings on it? some kind of boardwalk, perhaps. With further looking, we see on the bank but behind the scholar, his servant hunched over and wearing a bluish coat. The road follows the water edge back into depth, and beyond it, the winding stream that feeds into this inlet. And above, a sloping hill and distant peaks, as familiar as the pine tree and the angular rocks in lower left that mark the nearest point, as the hill and the peaks mark the furthest. A vertical fold mark just left of center suggests that this and probably the other leaves were at one time mounted as broad folding album leaves. But the later leaves also show signs of vertical breaking or creasing of the silk, indicating perhaps that the leaves have been mounted successively in a hand scroll. The later leaves, that is, closer to the inner roller, are bent more sharply as they are rolled and unrolled, and so they develop more creases than those at the beginning or the outside. But all this, as I say, we'll have to wait for more research from the album that's available for it. All these are matters that I can only suggest for future researchers who have access to the album itself to look for. And I hope my long treatment of this album has inspired some young Japanese painting specialists or would-be specialists to do just that. Bring the album out of obscurity, photograph it properly, 
look to its conservation, and study it seriously in ways that I haven't been able to do just from the reproductions. Looking hard at long at the leaves of this album has persuaded me, and I hope it's persuaded many of you, that Tajima was quite right in seeing this as one of the finest and most important of Seshu's works. He makes it second only to the long scroll or the Māori scroll. I would put it well ahead of that scroll in importance. The question of why this album has been ignored by present-day Seshu scholars looms all the more insistently now that we have seen how remarkably original, rewarding, and important it is within Seshu's works. I once meant to present it with a question, if Seshu could imitate the styles of the late Song Chinese masters so closely as this, more closely than any Ming artist could do, judging at least from Ming paintings we know, if he could do this, what made him move on to leave all that behind and move into quite different styles, those of his late period? Now I would alter that formulation to ask, where does this remarkable work belong within his oeuvre? Roughly, when can it be dated? And how does it expand our understanding of Seshu's great contribution to later Japanese painting, especially ink monochrome landscape painting, suiboku sanzui, but also poetic painting, uh, po painting with figures as it's practiced by artists like Busan. And it raises also the large question, which I touched on earlier, is it really possible for an artist to position himself in a gombric-like series, a stylistic development, when he is three centuries later than what he inherits, and in a geographically separated place and a different cultural tradition, as Seshu seems to have done here. Perhaps the best parallel would be some American painting taking up a European style complex from the Renaissance or the Baroque and doing something new with it. I can't quickly think of an example. But this whole revelation has come to me as I worked on this album, this lecture conscious of being one of the few people, if not the only person, who had the right background for doing it as I have. It's filled with me with the excitement of someone breaking new ground with old materials. Next. I'll conclude this long lecture with a brief look at another great and famous work by Seshu, his horizontal painting of Amano Hashidate, The Bridge Standing in Heaven, a work from his late years and representing not some memory or imagination, but a real place in Japan, well known to those who have traveled around to see its famous scenery. Uh, the painting is done in ink on paper with a few touches of light color, like some of the album leaves we've looked at. It's a work exhibiting no prominent brushwork, no conspicuous references to older styles. It's as close to styleless as a painter of that time could manage. Alas, I have no original slide of it, much less details, and I can only show it in this image made from a reproduction. I put it on to represent Seshu as a thoroughly Japanese artist and an enormously influential one for later Japanese painters, especially landscapists. More whole lectures could be devoted to Seshu's followers. I myself once did a lecture at the Los Angeles County Museum on my website as CLP120, about Seshu and his follower Sesson, titled Two Snowy Peaks Seen from Afar. Both of them have the character Setsu for snow in their names, Sesson having adopted it as a self-proclaimed disciple of Seshu, although he never knew him, having been born after Seshu's death. Also on my website, by the way, as CLP 100, is another lecture I gave at the same place on Japanese ink painting, preserved only in part, but perhaps interesting to anyone who wants to pursue this subject. Next. The place depicted here, Amano Hashidate, is located at the town of Miyazu in Tango Prefecture, about two hours train ride north of Kyoto. I went there with a group of people, led by my good friend Tsuji Nobuo, seen here, Tsuji Nobuo and others, to spend a few days there going around the places where Busan paintings were to be seen. Of course, we walked across the sand spit, which is about three and a half kilometers in length, with some 8,000 pine trees growing on it. We stayed over one night sleeping in a temple located at one end of the sand spit, the Chionji. And then we stayed several days more in a ryokan, or Japanese inn, in Miyazu. Next. We ascended to the place from which one gets the best view 
and perform the required action there. You stand with your back to it, lean over, and look at it through your legs. I could do things like that easily then, but wouldn't want to try it now. And we saw it like this, upside down, supposedly looking like a bridge in the sky or in heaven. Our remaining time in Miyazu, we spent looking at the paintings that Yosa Busson did when he spent two years there in his early period. Here is a Busson painting from his great late period. I'll have a whole lecture on him later. Anyway, Busson spent two years there in what is called his Tango Jidai, or period in Tango Prefecture. And I can't say that without concluding with one of my favorite puns, the kind I used to drop into my serious lectures. I would say, from 1750, Yosa Busan spent two years in Miyazu in Tango Prefecture, in what is called his Tango Jidai. He traveled there, of course, in the famous two-seated sedan chair, renowned in Japanese classical verse for the often used poetic phrase, it takes two to tango. And then I would go on talking quickly while watching the audience to see how they reacted, expressions of disbelief. Did he really say that? And a few hesitant giggles. And with that, I end this very long two-part lecture, uh, hoping that I have this irrelevant and irreverent ending called forth a few giggles from my video audience out there in a spirit of always leave them laughing or at least giggling. Yours, James Cahill. Mm -hmm.